Hi folks. So since we've been studying kind of at a distance, we haven't had in class time to work on labs, I thought I would do a little walkthrough of the anatomy diagrams and the key points of the bones of the skull that I want you to know because I know it's hard to sometimes figure this out just looking at figures and not seeing 3D shapes. So that's my goal today. So I don't exactly plan out how I'm gonna do this, but I'm going to, I've got my diagrams pulled up so I can make sure I cover the things I need to. And I brought in um, two of our models. So this is our, what we call a exploded skull model. And what this does is it shows the uh, bones of the skull all separated. So I can use this to demonstrate, hopefully some key points on here. And then that's from a real human skull. This is a model in a cast resin so that we can uh, look at some of the structures that are harder to see on the exploded skull. So that's what we're gonna be going through. So let's go ahead and start in the front and just name some of the major bones of the skull. And I'm gonna actually pull this model up here and I should get a stand for this. I'll be right back. Okay, so hopefully you can see this guy a little better. This is my exploded skull. And you can see right away that the cranium of the skull has bigger, rounder bones. We have in the front, the frontal bone, then we have these two parietal bones that also fit right where that parietal lobe would be. And in the very back, we have the occipital bone where that occipital lobe would be. With these sutures where the skull would be sewn together in between. Then here on the side by the temple, the temporal bone, that connects to this Oh, where is it? Zygomatic bone here for the cheekbone. The maxilla, the mandible. Those are some of our very important key bones here. So on this skull, frontal bone, temporal bone, all the way back to here, occipital bone, Temporal bone, zygomatic, maxilla, mandible. All right, so with that in place, let's look at these bones one at a time for the key extra structures I want you to know. So with the frontal bone, oops, I moved my little guy right out of the way. That's this bone here. And there's really, only two key structures you need to know on this bone, and one of them you can't actually see in the models themselves. We have the supraorbital foramen. That means supra over the orbit of the eye, and foramen means hole. And so on some skeletons, this will be an actual hole, and in other cases, it's a supraorbital, sorry, supraorbital notch because the hole has not sealed all the way with bone, you can see these two notches at the top of the orbits of the eye, and those are passageways for blood vessels and nerves. This skull model, you can also see them as notches right here. The other important feature of this bone is the frontal sinus, which opens up into the nasal cavity. So a sinus is a hollow space within a bone in this case. And so you will not be able to see the frontal sinus because it is inside this bone. But you'll notice that if I tip it back, you can kind of see that there's some thickness to this bone. So the sinuses are right in here in the forehead. So here I pulled up on Google. This is an image that you can actually see inside that frontal bone. So here's the frontal bone of the skull. And you can actually see that there's a space right here that's open 
inside the bone, and that is the frontal sinus. And in fact, if I pull up oops, this image, I don't know what's going to happen here. Oh, that's not what I was trying to open. Here we go. If you pull up this image, you can also see that the frontal sinuses are located right here. So next, let's move into the back of the skull and look at this occipital bone more closely. So you can see the occipital bone coming here, joining with the parietal bones. And for the occipital bone, there's only three major landmarks I want you to know. The first is the foramen magnum. Remember that foramen is a hole, so this means the big hole. And if I look at this skull here, the foramen magnum is the big hole where the vertebral column exits out of the skull. And our next landmark is also going to be there because as the vertebral column passes out, we have these two bulb-shaped bumps that are called the occipital condyles. A condyle is an articular surface of a joint. And the joint here is going to be where we join with the spinal column. And so this is the articular surface with that first vertebrae. Remember the first vertebrae is called the axis, sorry, the atlas, because the atlas holds the globe on his shoulders. And you can see these has actually little spikes because it used to be attached to a bigger model. Those spikes are right where those occipital condyles would articulate. Like, right like that, to let the head nod up and down on that axis, atlas. And then the atlas would articulate with the axis that has the dens, the tooth that sticks up and articulates right into that atlas. And now that's our pivot point for our neck. That's cervical vertebrae two. The final landmark on this skull is the external occipital protuberance. And that is basically a point that stands out at the back of the occipital bone. And that bony point is formed by muscles pulling on the bone. So this is the site where muscles attach for the posterior neck. And we can actually see that on our other specimen as well, this point here. It's not a very sharp point, but there's a distinct marking where the bone has built up from being pulled on. That covers the occipital bone. You have one frontal bone, one occipital bone. Let's go to the parietal bones, because you have two of those, one on each side. So remember, these are the parietal bones. They merge the frontal bone with the occipital bone, and we don't need to know any extra features on these. So two of those. Now let's go to the temporal bone. This is looking at the side of the skull. So let me orient you first actually on, um, whoops, on a skull here. So the temporal bone is right over your temple and around your ear. So here's our temporal bone. And so the easiest way to spot this one is because you have that hole where you would have entrance into the ear canal and the beginning of the zygomatic arch. Your zygomatic arch on your face is right here. So when people say sometimes we say they have high cheekbones or high zygomatic arches, that's formed partly by the temporal bone where it connects into the zygomatic bone. So your key features on here, the ethmoid, sorry this is not the ethmoid bone, the temporal bone is very important for protecting the structures of the inner ear, some of which are bones. So we have the external auditory meatus. A meatus is a hole or an opening for a passageway. So this is the opening for the ear. And we can also see it on this skull here. It's right where your ear canal goes in. 
Next, we have the mastoid process. This is actually a bump right behind the ear. So if we look on here, you can see that behind the external auditory meatus, we have a process that's sort of a U-shaped bump. That's our mastoid process. If you feel on your own head, feel right behind your ears, you can actually find the bump of this behind your ear and feel it. Now, this is where the sternocleidomastoid muscle attaches, and you can actually tell where that muscle attaches because it has all the bones in its name. Sterno for your sternum, clado for your clavicles, and then it comes up and attaches to your mastoid right here to pull and turn your head. So next, you have the Actually, let me show it to you on here first. So we have right here that mastoid process coming down. Now, this one you can't see well on the real school because it has been uh, worn off in our model, but you can find it on here. And we have the styloid process, so kind of back under here, poking down. Let's see two of them. So these often break off on models because they're little and delicate styloid process. Process means sticking out. And remember, styloid, we've heard that term before, refers to a stylus or a pen because it looks like the point of a pen. You have styloid processes on your corners of your wrist as well. So the styloid process is another attachment site. This is where the muscles connect to your hyoid bone, hyoid bone and your tongue. Now, I couldn't find our hyoid bone. Um, and it doesn't connect into the rest of the skull, which is one of the reasons that bone often isn't included on skeletons. But if you wait just a moment, I'll pull up a figure. All right, so this is a figure looks like from KenHub, and you can see that the hyoid bone is actually free floating. It does not articulate with any other bones of the skull or skeleton. And it's right up here at the top of our trachea and larynx. And it serves primarily as an anchoring site for your tongue. So the hyoid bones, two points will come up and connects via ligaments to the stylus. Sorry, I should say the styloid process. So now coming back to this bone, we continue on. Our next big landmark is the mandibular fossa. And that is how this bone connects to the mandibles. This is our articulating point with our mandible or our jawbone. And again, I think I'm going to show you first on here that there's a little divot right in here under, and you can actually feel it. You have that arch of your cheekbone and coming down from here, you can feel that spot where your jawbone is coming up and connecting in. So if I show us on the model, we have under that external auditory meatus, that zygomatic arch, the cheekbone. Here's the mandible, the mandibular condyle, and it's sitting right in a little fossa or hollow right here. So that's the articulation site for the mandible. Okay, next we need the petrous portion of the bone. Petrous comes from the word for rock, like Peter. Peter is the rock. And this is named because it's a very, very hard portion of the bone. So then you were like, this is the hard part. And it's the part that contains the middle and inner ear. So it's very hard to protect those delicate bones of the ear. And in fact, I'm gonna start by showing you the little bitty bones that are found inside of your ear. So these are very tiny, very delicate. They are named basically the stirrup, the hammer, and the anvil, respectively. Stapes, incus, and malleus. And I was pointing at the wrong ones. <laughs> I can't see this backwards. But these little tiny, tiny bones are what allow you to hear effectively. And so in order to protect them, we tuck them away inside the petrous portion of the, sorry, zygomatic, the temporal bone. And it's a little hard to angle this model so you can see it, but I will do my best. So if I turn this model around, you can actually see right through here that there's a sticking in part right here. Let's see if I can get it, there we go. This portion here that sticks in 
is very solid and very sturdy and very thick. That's the petrous portion of the bone. I'm also going to show it to you on the inside of the skull. So if I take my skull here and open him up and let you see inside, you can see this here is the temporal bone. This is the temporal bone on the inside and this hard sticking up part is the petrous portion of the temporal bone. Next, we are going to stay inside so that we can see what's going on in here. And you'll notice that near that petrous portion, we also have some useful cavities. Give me one minute to get a better angle on this. All right, so in here we have some more passageways for vessels. Obviously this is down here in the occipital bone. You can see the uh, foramen magnum. And then up here in the temporal bone, here's the petrous portion, and you can see a couple holes, but the two important ones are this very round one, more anterior. This is the carotid canal. That is the passage of the internal carotid, where it comes in, and that internal carotid is going to branch up into the brain to that cerebral arterial circus, circuit, circle <laughs> that runs inside the brain. And then a little behind it, and actually, it's, you can only see part of it tucked down this way. It's a bigger hole, but it's tucked down more into the bone, is the jugular foramen. That is the space where the internal jugular vein will exit out and carry blood out of the inside of the brain. This is also where three of the cranial nerves, number 9, 10, and 11, will pass through to exit down and out of your skull. So let me actually show you that under the skull, and you can see here that we have our, trying to see it on the other side, our, oh my goodness, here we go. So if I put my pen here, that is the jugular foramen, and I come around this way, you can see the tip of my pen right there, right here. And then the internal carotid hole would be up here. All right. So that was fun. Uh, the carotid canal. So let's move on to another bone, and we will do next the ethmoid bone, which is going to be found in the front of the skull. So let's turn our skull around, back him up so we can see what we're looking at. We've got the mandible down here. And to reorient us, remember that we have our frontal bone, parietal, temporal. I'll go ahead and say the temporal connects right here to make that zygomatic arch with the zygomatic bone. The zygomatic bone is connecting here to the maxillary bone. It's the up, essentially the upper mandible. And now we're in the front. Now one bone is missing from this skull model, and that is the bone that would run right here along the bridge of the nose and be called the nasal bone. And if we look at this skull, go back to the other. Oh my goodness. That would be just a little piece of bone right here. Just right here. So oh, actually, yeah, actually I tell a lie. If I look really, really close here, you can actually see that the nasal bone has been divided in half and fused onto the maxillary bones right here. So that's one half of the nasal bone. Here's the other half of the nasal bone. So it is on here, it's just, I couldn't find it. <laughs> it's there. All right, and that would connect right up here. All right, so I said we would do the ethmoid bone. So let's get that oriented for you. One moment. All right, so just to briefly orient us on the figure here, that's our nasal bone. Here's our maxil maxillae, our maxillary bone. And back behind it in the middle, 
we have our nasal septum that kind of divides the wall between, and we're going to have the ethmoid bone even farther back than that. And you can actually also see part of the ethmoid bone here within the eye socket. And let me get you a side view one moment. This isn't a side view so much as a full on view of the bone, but it shows you better how it's oriented. It's back here, tucked in the back, and you can again see part of it inside the orbit of the eye. And it's actually very important in your sense of smell and in your nasal passages. So if we look at this bone, our key structures, and I'll show you a real bone in a moment, but let's first look at the simplified version. Our key structures, we have sticking up a spike called the crista galli. This is an anchor point for the membrane that stabilizes the brain. Then we have the cribriform plate that actually goes kind of side to side like this and runs along here. The cribriform plate, cribriform means it has holes in it. And so the cribriform plate has the olfactory foramina, sense of smell foramen, little holes that allow little olfactory nerves, axons to come up through the bone out of your nose or come contrarywise down and receive put sensory receptors into your nose, pass through this bone in the cribriform plate. We also have the two of the conche in your, that are inside your nasal cavity. So your nasal cavity has three conche. Conche means shells, basically three sets of sort of a, a dividing wall or a shell and then spaces in between them that are called your nasal meatuses. Remember, meatus means space. So two of your nasal conche are here, the middle and superior nasal conche. So here's our middle nasal conche. Here's our more superior nasal conche. Can't really see them very well in this figure. And they, the purpose of having these layers of bone in your nasal passage is that you have more surface area that's nice and moist and full of mucous membrane. And that allows you to filter the air better and have lots of mucous membrane to catch any dust and debris you're breathing in. And it also lets you warm and humidify the air so that when the air hits your lungs, it isn't as dry, it doesn't crack and damage the delicate tissue of your lungs. So you have these concha, and then uh, you don't need to know the names of which one's which, and then the, the inferior, the third concha, is actually its own bone, which we'll talk about later. The next structure, so I'm checking my list to make sure I hit everything, of course, the perpendicular plate forms uh, part of the nasal septum, so that dividing up and down nasal septum. So it meets a bone called the vomer to help finish that nasal septum up and down. And then in these sort of side parts, we call this either the ethmoid sinus or the ethmoid air cell, because it's not really so much one big sinus as a bunch of ethmoid like chunks of sinuses. And so it's uh, layers of very thin bone with big hollows inside of them that again help create um, part of those sinus cavities inside your brain. So remember we had the frontal sinuses and now we have the ethmoid sinuses. All right. All right, returning to our exploded skull, if I now pull these maxillae out of the way, you can see right here, at the beginning of where you would have that nasal septum, the bone dividing your nose, you actually see here the ethmoid bone. And it's small and delicate, and actually portions of it have broken off on our model, but you can see the spike here sticking straight up, the crista galli, the cribriform plate. If I get this at just the right angle, you might be able to tell that has holes in it, but I don't know that you will. Yeah, I don't think my thing's gonna focus, but right along here, this sort of surface like this, you can actually see little holes through which the olfactory foramina would pass. You can see off to the side, this ethmoid air cells and look how, ooh, I'm gonna be very gentle with it. You can see how delicate it is. That's why it's sort of broken off on the other one. These are very delicate parts of your bone, which is why banging your nose can really do some damage in there. And then the conche are 
also part of these kind of sinuses where we come off to the side. Here's some of the conche coming out to the side and down here. And then we have our right up and down here underneath the crystagalli. And underneath the cripperform plate, we have our perpendicular plate. Because the perpendicular plate goes like this, the crista, uh, the cripperform plate goes more like this, and the crystagalli sticks up on the top. The perpendicular plate forms part of the nasal septum, and it's going to come down and join. Let's see if I can find it. Here it is. This little bone here. Get everybody all rotated back together. So this bone here, pulling on the wrong part, is the vomer that will form the other part of that nasal septum. Um, not this actual cartilage in here, but inside the skull. So if I look at the real skull, I don't think this skull, we can see any of the parts because they are tucked away inside, but that is kind of back in this space back here and up inside the nose. One sec. All right, let's get that up. All right, so I pulled up a figure that I found online to show you a little clearer view of how some of these bones fit into the skull. So here you can see the uh, where the actual ethmoid bone sits in the skull under this frontal bone, behind this nasal bone and the maxillae. And you can see that there are one, two, well, three, let's see, here's the inferior, inferior nasal conche. So there's one, two conche that are part of the ethmoid bone itself. And then this is going to be a separate bone down here, but you can see that as air comes in to the nasal cavity, these bones divide the nasal cavity into three spaces. We have a meatus here, a meatus here, and a meatus here, and that'll provide lots of surface area to humidify and warm that air and capture any dust particles as it comes through. Meanwhile, up at the top with this superior nasal conche, we have the cripperform plate where we have all those olfactory receptors reaching down and sampling the air and providing our sense of smell. And projecting upwards, we would have the uh, not visible in this picture, crystagalli, that's the anchor point for stabilizing the membrane of the brain. And then from a front on view, you can actually see some of these pieces, the inferior nasal concha, as I said, is a separate bone, but these two here, we have the perpendicular plate that's forming that middle septum, connecting down here to the vomer, and then running all the way up here. Um, deeper inside the skull where you can't see it is that superior nasal concha, and then visible through the hole of the nose is the middle nasal concha. And then you can also kind of get a glimpse of where these sit um, off to the side over here. So, and then we have tucked completely in front of it. This would be the nasal bone itself in blue on the front. So hopefully that helps you orient yourself a little more to this sort of complex internal bone of the skull. I don't know why I have my sunglasses on my head. All right, so let's move on to the next bone. All right, so returning to our exploded skull, the next bone we're gonna look at, as you remember, we just finished looking at this bone right back in here the ethmoid bone, and now we're gonna look at this bone, also somewhat internal, but not entirely. You'll notice it's tucked back. We have the frontal bone, we have the parietal bone, we have this, um, <laughs> I'm blanking here, temporal bone that connects up here to the zygomatic bone with that arch in the front. And then sort of in between them and ducking back behind that zygomatic arch, we have the sphenoid bone. And it actually connects, it's a single bone because it runs like a butterfly all through this interior part of the skull down to here. So you can see all these sections of sphenoid bone in here. It's another very delicate one that portions can break off pretty easily. So a lot of the structures we're gonna look at are actually structures for inside of the eye socket. So let me pull up my other guy for a minute. One of these days I'm gonna lose him off the edge and we're gonna be in trouble. So here we go. So as we said, the sphenoid bone is kind of back in here inside the skull. And some of the structures we're gonna look at are actually our passageways out of the sphenoid bone. So if you look in here, I get the angle right, you can actually see 
a couple different holes by which we could exit this skull. And specifically, I really need better lighting in here. There is, there we go. I think that's visible. You can see that there's a singular littler hole. Let me get my pointer. There we go. Right here. And then a little more lateral to it, there's more of a slit. And those are the two holes we're looking at. And then later we will look at the hole right here for the tear duct. But those are the two we're looking at right now, the little hole and the bigger slit. Let me see if I can find these on this guy or we're just totally not gonna be able to see them. Oh yeah, okay. So on here, it's actually fairly visible. You're in the way though. Can I move you or do you attach? You attach. There we go. So on here, you can actually see them. I've lost my pointer. Here we go. We have a singular little hole, a bigger slit. That little bitty hole is the optic foramen, sometimes called the optic canal. The foramen is the opening, the canal is the passageway back through the bone. And optic refers to the eyes, so this is where the optic nerve exits out of that orbit of the skull back to the brain. And then beside it, we have the superior orbital fissure. So it's a fissure rather than a hole. It's a little bigger, more like a, a sort of a cleavage. So that's what right here, the superior orbital fissure. And that will have the nerves that control eye movement rather than the nerve for vision itself. They pass through there. So there is inside of these bone, uh, sphenoidal sinuses. This you're not going to be able to see. I'm going to have to pull up on a diagram, but we have sort of a big hollow space inside the bone. I was trying to see if there's anywhere I can see it on this skull, and you'll just have to know that it's kind of back in here in this space. I'll pull it up on a diagram in a minute. And then we're going to flip it over and look at a structure sort of inside and underneath this bone that's right here up on the posterior of it. So I'm going to take this guy for you and we're going to kind of get up inside that bone. So let me open him up and turn him around. And here you can see, remember that this is the petrous portion of the temporal bone. Here is sort of our sphenoid bone coming along here. And the cool section we're looking at, well, first of all, you can actually see from the inside, there's the optic canal, there's the superior orbital fissure. So those are both visible inside. And remember down here we have our, oh, our carotid canal right here, and then our jugular foramen there. So we've got a bunch of holes, and then there's some other stuff that we won't get into. But back along here, you see this little notch right here that looks like something could sit right in that space. And that's because it is, it's a space for something to sit. This is where the pituitary gland that's hanging down from the hypothalamus of your butt, your brain sits right in that little notch. And so this notch is called the cella turkica and it's sometimes called the, I believe the hypophyseal notch. Hypophysis is another word for the pituitary gland. And cella turkica means Turkish saddle because when they were naming it, they thought it looked like saddles that the Turkish people would use that had support in the front and the back. And so it's a little Turkish saddle for the pituitary gland to sit in. Very cute. And as I said, the last portion of the bone is hard to point out, so I'm going to pull it up on a diagram. <laughs> and I thought I'd start with this diagram we just looked at because you can see um, here inside this bone right here. So here's our frontal bone with the frontal sinus and it connects to this sphenoid bone with a hole inside the bone that makes the sphenoid sinus. And give me one moment. And here's another view uh, from a figure I just pulled up where you can see the frontal sinus, the ethmoid sinus, and kind of back behind the ethmoid sinus and to either side, it's often drawn kind of around this way, we have the sphenoid sinus. Here's the ethmoid aerosols. You can see how nice and bubbly they are. 
and then the sphenoid sinus back here. And look, here is that little notch, the Turkish, that Stella Turkica, the Turkish saddle, with the pituitary glands coming right down from the brain back here. Here's the hypothalamus right here. So you can see how everything all fits together. All right. So of the bones we just looked at, we were talking about these, well, we were mostly focusing on what we call the cranial bulls, bones, that form that bowl-shaped skull, the cranium, and then we'll talk in a minute about the facial bones. So there are 20 total skull bones. Look at my hair. Eight of them are cranial bones. So we have the frontal bone, the occipital bone, the two parietal bones, the temporal bone, the sphenoid bone, the ethmoid bone, and that is one frontal, one occipital, one ethmoid, one sphenoid, two parietals, two temporals. That's our eight bones of the cranium. Now we can switch to talking about the 14 facial bones. And most of these guys are right up here on the projecting forward facial part of the skull versus the bowl-shaped cranium of the skull that protects and holds the brain. So let's start with an easy one right down here. This is the mandible or jawbone. And mandible actually comes from the word mine, which means point or chin. And in Spanish, mine is minton, or chin, sorry, mine is minton. Uh, chin is minton. And so this is the mandible. And in fact, there are two holes for nerves to pass through in the front that are called the mental foramen. And this is not mental like mind, which comes from the word mens, meaning mind or to think, like mente in Spanish. This comes from the word mine, meaning point or chin, like minton. So here, you can actually see a little hole in the front. That is the mental foramen. And the mental foramen is the exit point for the trigeminal nerve or the branch of the trigeminal nerve that innervates the teeth. And if you remember, trigeminal nerve is facial sensation. So this is where your teeth get their facial sensation coming in. That actually connects in the back to the mandibular foramen. So I have to turn this guy around, and if you look here, you can see a hole in the back of the mandible that is runs all the way through this mandible, all the way through, and comes out in the front through that mental foramen. And the mandibular, sorry, the trigeminal branch of, or the branch of the trigeminal nerve will pass down through the jaw there, and you can actually see it opened up a little bit through here to come along here and innervate the teeth. And here you can see the various teeth sitting in their gomphoid joints sewn into the sockets in the skull where we open it up. Those are the only pig joints in the body. So aside from the mental foramen and the mandibular foramen, which carries uh, the mandibular foramen not only has the branch of the trigeminal nerve in it, but it also has nerves and other blood vessels for the lower teeth. The mandibular condyle, remember condyle is a, like our occipital condyles, it's a articular facet. So the articular or mandibular condyle is this part that sticks up here and it articulates with this, trying to find it on here, this, um, fossa up here. So looking at this on our other skull, it has the top of his head off, so I'm going to put that back together. You can see that we have nice articulation right here for the jaw. And then here's those mental foramen in the back. I don't know if it's on this skull. Well, yep, there it is. 
just hard to get the lighting to show it. Right here, not very visible, is where those mandibular foramen would enter and come through the mandible. This is called the mandibular condyle. And so this part in the front is called the mandibular body and it forms what we call the chin. That's it for that bone. The next big one, well, we already mentioned this one, is the vomer. We already talked about vomer, and you remember vomer is the lower half of the nasal septum. So that'll be easy to find because we just get our Facebook back together. And if you look, coming down from that ethmoid bone, here's the perpendicular plate, and it's going to join the vomer to form uh, the bony part of the nasal septum. You also have a cartilage part. Okay, next, the mandible is our lower jaw. We've also got teeth up here, and that is called the maxillary bones, or the maxilla. And I always remember these because in insects, they have a pair of mandibles, and they have a pair of maxilla that they use to manipulate their food. But I know most of you guys aren't entomologists like me, and you don't think a lot about the complicated mouth parts of, of um, insects. So actually, let me look up what that word is, or it originates from. Okay, well, maxilla comes from the word that means jaw. So that's great. And mandible, as I said, comes from both, it's similar to the word mine for point, like mental, and it also comes from the word for chewing, which is, uh, let's see, man mandere, something like that. I don't speak Latin. Vomer, by the way, comes from the word for plow because it looks like a plow. So we've got all sorts of useful words when we name things. Sometimes this helps, helps me, doesn't help everyone. So the maxilla is going to basically come down and form part of the basically triangle of your jaw right here. So if I put it in here, you can see the maxilla is two bones and they've taken them apart for us. And then over here we have the zygomatic bones attached up here. But this here coming down, here's part of the nasal bone sewn onto part of the maxilla that also goes up and forms that arch of your nose. And then comes down here and forms the part that has the teeth in it. And you can see it has all of the teeth in it and actually part of the hard roof of the mouth. So what are our key things to look at here? Well, we've got another sinus. This one we can actually probably see inside since it's split open. So let's see. Well, I don't know if you can tell where we're looking at, so let me see if I can get a good angle. But first, let's say it's basically right in this area here. And if I pull this guy out of the way, see this big pocket here? This would be a sealed pocket full of air. That's your maxillary sinus, and you can actually see it's partly. Uh, well, that's a different bone. We'll talk about that later, but it's in there, right in this space in here. So that's one of our maxillary sinus. More big hollow spaces in our bones. And then the other big part is going to be that part of that bony roof of our mouth. So remember the front half of our mouth has the bony palate or the hard palate, and then the back half of our mouth has the soft palate, and you can actually feel that with your fingers or your tongue where it's hard in the front and softer in the back. So the bony palate has two bones that are part of it. It's partly these fused base of the maxilla, and then there's also going to be a palate or palatine bone. So we have specifically the palatine process is the part sticking off of that maxilla. Let's see if we can get a good angle here. Coming back here, so if I come along here, this right here, palatine process going back to form the roof of the mouth and projecting like a process. And then they're actually folded up. Nope, they're back here out of the way a little bit. This back here is the palatine bone. There are two of these as well. They form the the interior part of the hard, oh, sorry, they form the posterior part, that makes sense, sorry, in the back. So we have the interior part of the bony palate or the hard palate from the maxillae, and then in the back we have the palatine bones forming the posterior part of the hard palate. So let me see if I can get a figure up for you guys just to orient us to those. All right, so here we have our open stacks figure. And you can see we are in this space in here. This is a skull that's kind of cut in half through the middle. And so here you can see that um, sphenoid bone. Here you can see 
the ethmoid coming up this way, the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid with its cripperform plate running this way, its crystagalli up here, sphenoid sinus, this is where our ethmoid air cells would be, and then here that perpendicular plate meets the vomer to form that nasal septum. And then we are down on the maxilla. And so you can see projecting back, here's our palatine process of the maxilla. Here's our maxillary sinus. You can't see it very well, but it'd be right around in this space. And then right back here in the very back, this little bitty bone at the very back is the palatine bone. So we have all sorts of fun stuff. Let's keep going. Alas, poor Yorick. So we're back to our skull model. It's beautiful. And now we're going to look at the bone I mentioned several times, but it is technically a facial bone and not a bone of the cranium. And that is this over here, connecting point. This is the zygomatic bone. It connects back here to the temporal bone. Remember the temporal bone came forward to connect this zygomatic arch of your cheekbone. So the zygomatic arch is actually formed by both the temporal bone and the zygomatic bone right in here. And so it forms part of the socket of the eye and down around here, and then the maxilla takes over from there. So let me get my exploded skull. And we'll actually find this bone by itself. Again, let me put him back together a little bit for you. So here we have our maxilla. Here we have our temporal bone. And so right here is our zygomatic bone. And you can see that that zygomatic bone comes over here and joins the temporal bone to make that zygomatic arch. And it also forms part of the orbit of the eye socket and then comes down and joins the maxilla. So what structures do we need to know on the zygomatic bone? Just that zygomatic arch, those high cheekbones. Zygomatic arch connects the zygomatic bone with the temporal bone. And we actually consider the zygomatic arch to have the part one bone and part the other where it fuses because we just named that whole arch. So that's two bones there. We have the nasal bone, which I mentioned already that forms the bridge of the nose. And so the nasal bone is actually reinforced on the sides by the maxilla. But here in the front, this is a single nasal bone that has been split. No, nope, it's two nasal bones. <laughs> Sorry, it's two nasal bones. They would fuse here and then they would also join the maxilla right here where these staples are. So here's our nasal bone. And if I get my big boy or my solid boy, you can see again, here's that zygomatic bone right here, coming back here to the zygomatic arch. And then here is the nasal bone right here with the sides of the maxilla coming up to reinforce it on each side. So nasal bone, nasal bone, right up in there. All right, next we have the lacrimal bone and lacrimal refers to tears. If I say something is lacrimose, I mean it's very sad, almost, almost, uh, almost over the top sad. That was a very lacrimose play. You put on a lacrimose display. So you're just full of tears and just over the top sad. So the lacrimose or lacrimal bone is the bone right where our tear ducts are gonna be. So let's find it for you. Give me one second to get set up. I'm actually gonna pull it up on a figure first to orient us. All right, so here's our front on skull from OpenStax make this a little bigger. There we go. And you can see, again, we're looking at this eye socket. Here's our zygomatic bones over here. Here's our maxilla. Here's our nasal bones. And then right kind of back there, sort of deeper into that bridge of your nose on the sides of your eyes is going to be the, in green here, the nasal bone. And then the nasal bone itself, sorry, not the nasal bone, <laughs> the lacrimal bone. What are we talking about? This is the nasal bone. This is the maxilla. Here's the laximal bone, and then reinforcing a little farther back, we have here the ethmoid bone, a little portion of that visible, and then even a little farther back than that, we actually get back to the sphenoid bone. So it's kind of a complex region here, and you can kind of think the layers as we move back through the, through the skull, think of it in that terms as you walk your way backwards into the skull. 
Um, but the lacrimal bone is right where our tear duct is going to be. So let's actually scroll down. By the way, I wanted to point out that that palatine bone, there's even a tiny point of it visible in the orbit of the eye. That's how crazy our interactions of our bones are. And I'm not going to get into that on the test, um, some of these fine details. But here's our lacrimal bone. Let's zoom down here. Side view, you can see it a lot better where it is now because here you can see that it's kind of a, a rounder shape filling in this space. And there's a sort of a fossa, an indentation that would lead to the hole. And that's for our tear ducts. Tear ducts come down here and then they empty down into your nasal passages. So that is the lacrimal fossa. It's a dip that has the lacrimal canal, the passageway for the tears to enter into your nasopharynx. So the other important structure that we're going to want to look for is, oh, no, is that's a separate bone. So let me go ahead and pull up my skeleton and we'll look for the lacrimal bone on the skeleton. So here's our Mr. Exploded skeleton again, partway put together so you can see the nose and the, oops, I should turn him so his eye sockets line up. And so we know that the lacrimal bone, we have the nasal bone, then the edges of the maxilla, and the lacrimal bone should sit right in here. And oh, look, it's missing, but it actually is on here. It's wired for us right over here. So it's this bone that would tuck in right here, and they've wired it off to one side so you can see the shape of it. So here's the lacrimal bone that would tuck right up in that space. And if I get my little skull, you can actually see here, we have again, the nasal bones, the maxilla, and then if you get the lighting just right, you can actually see that this is the round, you can see the edges of the lacrimal bone right in here. And dipping down, here we go, there's the lacrimal fossa and the lacrimal canal to carry those tears out of the eye as they wash through. So they actually come through ducts up here, wash across the eye, and then drain down through the nose. All right, the last bone that we're going to talk about, let me make sure I got everybody, should be. So the last bone we're going to talk about is one I also already mentioned, and that is the inferior nasal concha. So if you remember, we have those um, upper two nasal concha up in the ethmoid bone. And then I said the last one that you could see through the hole in the nose is the inferior, excuse me, the inferior nasal concha. So um, in terms of this guy, the superior is kind of up here back behind the nasal bone. Here's the, trying to find them. Mm, I think this one is the medium and then this is the inferior nasal concha. So it is a separate bone. And here you can actually see it also pulled off to the side. Oops. Right here. And it will join up at the base of the white bone. So give me one second again to pull up a better figure because this is hard to see on the skull. So this is again from our open stacks anatomy figure. And here as we count our way back, Here's the lacrimal bone and the, um, actually we're gonna go inside the nose. I'm looking at the eye socket for some reason. I'm clearly getting tired. But back in here in the nose, you can see the vomer with the perpendicular bone of that ethmoid bone coming up to form the nasal septum. And then off to the side, you can see the middle nasal concha. Remember the superior kind of tucked back inside behind the nose, uh, the ridge of the nose bone. But we have the inferior nasal concha, which is its own separate bone. And here again, a cross section of the skull, we get inside this nasal cavity where you have one, two, three conchae. I don't know if I said this, but conchae means shell, like a conch shell. And so that's because the inside of the nose um, and the skull actually looked kind of like a conch shell to people. And so here we have one, two, three, and this one here in green is separate. That's the inferior nasal conchae. These two up here are part of that ethmoid bone. So if we take our skull, and again, we have those conchae in there. So if I look from the back, I can also see, oops, the lighting is not good, but in here, this is the exit of that nasal passage, and that's where the ridges 
if you get the lighting just right, you may be able to see the ridges of the conche inside that nasal passage. So that is the 14 facial bones. Let's remember them again. We have the mandible, the vomer, which meets, makes the lower half of the nasal septum and meets that perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. We have the one, two maxilla or maxillary bones. We have the, they form most of the palate, but in the back we have the palatine bones, one, two, forming the posterior part of the hard palate. We have the zygomatic bone, forming part of the zygomatic arch. We have two of those. We have two nasal bones, forming the bridge of the nose. We have two lacrimal bones, right here where the tears empty out. And then we have two inferior, inferior nasal conche, um, separate along the interior of the nasal passage. So that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. Who am I missing? <laughs> oh no. One second. No, I have them all. I just forgot to count the inferior nasal conche on my list. So those are all of our key parts of the skull. And don't forget, not attached to the skull, but dangling down inside would be the hyoid bone, um, connecting indirectly to these styloid processes and anchoring the tongue to the beginning of the uh, larynx. I was gonna say trachea and that's a little farther down. And then we have the two important cervical vertebrae, the first one being the atlas, which articulates with these occipital condyles, the second one being the axis, which has the dens that lets the skull turn on its axis. And then the last thing you should study is the sutures of the skull. Okay. So to name these bones, they actually, uh, sorry, these sutures, in the skull, especially particularly in the cranium of the skull. We can actually name them based on their location, their angle, what they look like. So if you were to take a coronal section, coronal refers to the crown, and you would cut yourself straight into front and back. They're sometimes also called frontal sections. And sure enough, if I cut the skull right between the frontal bone and these parietal bones in the back, that is my coronal suture. It's a coronal cut or a frontal cut, right where the frontal bone, frontal means forehead, but also means in the front, would fit. If I were to make a sagittal section, I would be cutting myself into left and right halves, specifically if I did a mid-sagittal section. And sure enough, this, this suture dividing the skull down the middle is the sagittal suture, and it's between the two parietal bones. Now the sagittal suture divides and comes this way, so the occipital bone and the two parietal bones has this bindi suture, and this is called the lamboidal suture. And you might think, what does this have to do with lambs? But it's actually named for the Greek letter lambda, or the letter L, because this looks like a letter L. So that's easy to remember. Well, relatively easy. We have one more important suture, and that is here between the temporal bone and the parietal bone, so right here. This is called the squamosal suture. Squamous means scale. For example, we talked about the squamous cells of the body that are flat and squashed and scale-like. And this portion of the temporal bone that sits up like a fan and is very flat is called the squamosal portion because it's like a big flat scale back here. And so the squamosal suture attaches the squamosal portion of the temporal bone to the parietal bones. And with that, you now know all the bones of the skull that you need to know for your anatomy lecture. And it only took us a while. So practice labeling your figures. Make sure you think about the fact that there are things on the figures you don't need to know. There are things on the figure that aren't labeled that you wanna make sure you can find. So I, it, it takes a while, but practice labeling them. I like to color code different sections so I can see what I'm looking at. And part of the reason I gave you more views than you need is to help orient you to different angles of the bones and see what's going on. Um, 
in terms of what I'm likely to ask about on the anatomy practical, which figures I'm likely to use, I will always use either one or more figures to give you a really good view of the bone I'm indicating. I won't just be like, what's this little point of a bone you can see inside the eye socket? I'll generally give you two views of the bone or some extra context clues. And I have at the end of the anatomy diagrams a list of the kind of key topics I'm going to ask about, the number of bones, the skull, and the face, and um, a couple just key landmarks on them so you can get an idea how long to spend on this. But good luck to you guys, and I'm going to go teach class.